بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome. This is a collection of stories that will help young Muslim youth connect to their historical and contemporary role models. All of the researchers and performers who contributed to the CD are kids just like you. It is our sincere hope that you will enjoy this CD as much as we enjoyed researching and producing it. Jazakallahu khairan. Once there was a school student who turned up late in his class. Why are you so late? demanded his teacher. Sir, Iqbal always comes late. The student gave a confident, intelligent reply. Note that in Urdu, Iqbal means prosperity or success. The teacher was pleasantly surprised by the intelligent and profound reply of his student and from that moment on always held a high opinion of him. That student was none other than Pakistan's national poet, Alama Muhammad Iqbal. It was this type of intelligence and out-of-the-box thinking that made Iqbal the great person we have all come to know. Alama Iqbal was born in Sialkot, Pakistan on November 9, 1877 into a pious family. His grandparents were Brahmins who had converted to Islam. Alama Iqbal started his religious studies at the young age of four. He learned Arabic and Persian at the Scotch Mission College, where he met his professor, Sir Thomas Arnold, who had a great influence on him throughout his life. In 1895, Alama Iqbal enrolled in Government College Lahore to study philosophy, English literature, and Arabic. He got his master's degrees from Government College and Punjab University Lahore. In 1905, Iqbal traveled to England on the advice of Sir Thomas Arnold for higher studies in philosophy and law. While he was sailing to England, he passed by Saudi Arabia, which reminded him of the glorious times of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He was deeply troubled by the fact that the Muslim society had strayed from the message of Islam and was falling apart. Iqbal took admission in Trinity College, Cambridge, and eventually won a scholarship as a result of his hard work. From England, he went on to Germany to do his doctorate in philosophy, and then returned to London to qualify for the bar to become a lawyer. In 1908, he returned to Lahore from Europe. On his way back, while he was passing through the Mediterranean Sea, Iqbal burst into tears at the sight of Sicily, a city in Italy, as he was reminded of the golden Muslim era. Iqbal put his emotions into words through the following verse. Role ab dil khol kar ay dida ay khuna nabar Wo nazar aata hai tehzeeb e hijazi ka mazar Now we blood, O oh eyes, where the tomb of civilization stands there in sight. In Lahore, he taught philosophy for some time. However, he spent most of his life as a lawyer. Iqbal practiced as a lawyer from 1908 to 1934, when ill health compelled him to give up his practice. Enter Jenna and Zaina. What's the matter, Jenna? You look so gloomy. I just found out that I have to write a report on Pakistan's national poet, Alama Iqbal, and the deadline to turn it in is in just three days. I don't know what to do. I don't think I'll be able to finish it in time. Wow, what a coincidence. Last year, I had written a report on him too. I can help you. That would be great. I already know the basics of his life, but need to know some more details. Hmm. For example, one question I have is, what molded Iqbal into the person we know him as today? Okay, let me tell you a bit about that. The way I look at it, there are five elements that molded Iqbal into the person he was. One of those was his strong belief in Islam and love for the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He was so attached to the Prophet that in the last phase of his life, whenever the Prophet's name was mentioned, Iqbal couldn't control his tears. Iqbal was also very troubled by the state in the Muslim Ummah, 
and how Muslims had lost their past glory due to their internal conflicts and deviation from the path of Islam. Oh, okay. Iqbal attributed the decline of Muslims to the lack of religious zeal and self-esteem. He put some of his feelings in words through these verses. Kabhi ay naujawan muslim tadabbur bhi kiya tu ne? Wo kya gardon tha tu jiska hai ek tuta hua tara? Have ever you pondered, O oh Muslim youth, on deep and serious things? What was that world from which you are now only a broken star? Tujhe aaba se apne koi nisbat ho nahi sakti ke tu guftar wo kirdar, tu sabit wo sayyara. There is no standard by which to judge yours and your forefathers' worth. You utter words, but they did deeds. They roamed the world. You are sedentary. Wow, that's very deep and beautiful poetry. Iqbal believed that the development of self or ego was an important part of human development. He placed great value on the disciplining of selfhood and cultivation of the ego. This was the third element that formed his personality. Okay. He talks about this in one of his very famous verses. Khudi ko kar buland itna ke har takdeer se pehle khuda bande se khud puche bata teri raza kya hai. Develop the self so that before every decree God will ascertain from you what is your wish. Hey, I think I've heard this before. My parents say this to me all the time. Another factor that shaped Iqbal was his quest to learn, understand, and apply the Quran. Iqbal devoted his whole life to the study of his favorite book, the Quran. The fifth and last element that impacted Iqbal was the poem Masnavi e Manvi by Jalaluddin Rumi. This poem had a lot of influence on Iqbal, for it was one of the reasons that Iqbal started to write poetry. Iqbal considered Rumi as his teacher and mentor. Wow, that's great, Zaina. Do you know any stories about any of the five factors you just talked about? Yeah, I was just about to tell you one. Iqbal used to recite the Quran daily after the morning prayer. Whenever his father saw him reading it, he would ask, "What are you doing?" "I am reciting the Quran," Iqbal would reply. After some time, Iqbal asked his father, "You put the same question to me every day, and I gave the same reply. Why is that?" Iqbal's father thereupon replied, "I want to tell you that you should recite the Quran." as if it was being revealed to you then and there since then iqbal made it a point to read the quran with an intelligent appreciation of its import and in such a way as if it was really being sent down to him at that very moment that's cool can you talk about the poetry he wrote was it political philosophical or religious all of the above actually Iqbal's poetic works are in Urdu and Persian. As a result of his Persian work, he is also well known in Iran and Afghanistan. His Urdu poetry is widely acclaimed and considered one of the most prominent in Urdu literature. In his poetry, he stresses on Muslims of the subcontinent to a faith and belief in themselves. He motivates them through his poetry to develop a patriotic spirit and to strive for independence and a separate country. I heard something about Iqbal having trouble with what was happening around the time of World War I, but I wasn't too sure about it. Can you explain it to me a little more? Yeah, sure. World War I started in the year 1914. The Central Powers were against the Allied Powers. The Central Powers included the Ottoman Empire, Germany, Bulgaria, and Austria-Hungary. The Allied powers comprised stronger countries like Great Britain, France, and Russia. In the year 1918, the Allies won the war. The Ottoman Empire was broken into fragments and the Allies set about dividing it among themselves. Iqbal was deeply troubled 
by all of that and wrote a number of poems on this subject. That's really sad. Did that impact his thinking at all? Great question, Jenna. Actually, it did. In his early life, Iqbal was a proponent of Indian nationalism. However, because of what happened in the First World War, Iqbal realized that the Western powers were taking over other nations, robbing them of their ancestral treasures, and killing people in the name of nationalism. He also envisioned that the Muslims and Hindus in the subcontinent, having very different beliefs, could never become one nation. Hence, he became an opponent of nationalism. Wait, wasn't that when he came up with the idea of creating Pakistan? Yes. Great observation. In 1930, he was nominated to preside at the annual session of the Muslim League in Allahabad. It was in his presidential address that Iqbal, for the first time, presented the idea of creating a separate country for the Muslims. Iqbal said, "I would like to see the Punjab, Northwest Frontier Province, Sindh, and Balochistan amalgamated into a single state." Self-govern within the British Empire, or without the British Empire, the formation of a consolidated Northwest Indian Muslim state appears to me to be the final destiny of the Muslims, at least of Northwest India. He was of the opinion that it is in the best interest of the Muslims that a separate homeland be created for them. For this reason, he is called the ideological founder of Pakistan. That's an extraordinary guy that the Muslims in India had. There's one more thing I wanted to tell you. In August 1947, Pakistan and India became two independent countries. Unfortunately, Allah Akbar died on April 21st, 1938, without seeing his dream become reality. Wow, that is sad. I wonder if Iqbal was still alive when Pakistan was built. How would he have felt? I think he would have been very happy and excited to see his dream become reality. That's what I thought. Sometimes I think about the situation of Muslims nowadays and wonder if Iqbal was here. What would his message be for the Muslims? Come to think of it, the situation nowadays is not that much different from when Iqbal was alive. It seems to be actually worse. Not only is there a lack of respect for the Muslims, like at that time, but Muslims are also fighting with each other in the name of Islam. I think Iqbal would have pretty much given the same message as before, but would have put more emphasis on getting the Muslims to resolve their issues through dialogue and strive to become one Muslim Ummah. His following verses are equally applicable to our times as well. यूं तो सैयद भी हो मिर्जा भी हो अफगान भी हो तुम सभी कुछ हो बताओ तो मुसलमान भी हो यू आर नोन एज सैयद मिर्जास एंड यू कॉल योरसेल्फ पठान बट कैन यू ट्रूली क्लेम एज वेल द नेम ऑफ अ मुस्लिम हरम ए पाक भी अल्लाह भी कुरान भी एक कुछ बड़ी बात थी होते जो मुसलमान भी एक एंड वन ईयर काबा वन ईयर गॉड and one your great quran yet still divided each from each lives every musliman thank you so much for your help zaina you made it fun and interesting for me and i learned a lot about alama iqbal one thing that you taught me that i will never forget is how much iqbal really cared for the muslims i have learned what a good muslim he was and what he did for the muslim umma No problem. All the best with your assignment. Hope you get an A+. Plus. One week later. I got an A+. Plus. Yay! Awesome. I knew you could do it. The greatest person of all time. She was the first person and woman to accept Islam. She helped Islam in its earliest days. She was very supportive of the Prophet peace be upon him. The Prophet even said, "She believed in me when no one else did. She embraced Islam when people disbelieved me, and she helped and comforted me when there was no one else to lend me a helping hand." 
This is none other than Khadija bin Khuwalid. She was born in the year 555 in Mecca, Arabia. Her mother's name was Fatima bin Zaid and her father's name was Khuwalid bin Asad. Her father was famous in the tribe of Quraysh and he passed away in the famous battle of Fujar. So Khadija grew up in a lap of luxury. First, she married Abu Hala Malik. She wanted him to be a big businessman, but unfortunately, he died. After some time, she married Atik bin Aith, and she had one daughter named Hinda. The marriage soon broke up because of incompatibility. After all this, she only wanted to focus on expanding her father's business beyond the tribe of Quraysh. Years later, Khadija was a very rich lady who hired men to go to Syria and other places on her behalf. Her policy was to employ hard-working, honest, and distinguished men who would deal on her behalf and travel to faraway places like Syria and bring back goods to be sold in Arabia. Khadija was looking for someone to go on her behalf to Syria. Then she thought of Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was 25 and he had such an honest, truthful, and great conduct nature that attracted Khadija's attention. So she asked Muhammad if he would go and he gladly accepted. She also asked one of her friends, Maysara, to keep an eye on him. The trip proved to be very successful and her business earned about three times the usual amount of money. When Muhammad came back, Maysara told Khadija the strange stories about him like the one about the clouds following him to protect him from the heat. She was amazed. She thought of asking Muhammad to marry her, but she kept questioning this thought. What would her tribe say? How would her tribe react? And what was more, would her proposal be accepted to this young yet unmarried man from Quraysh? But she moved all those questions aside and made a decision of marrying Muhammad. So, despite her rejection of many honorable men that had asked for her hand, Khadija sent out one of her friend to ask him to marry her. Muhammad accepted the offer despite the fact that Khadija was 40 and he was only 25. Fifteen years after their marriage, Muhammad suddenly started to feel restless, and so he went to contemplate in the cave of Hira. Then he saw Jibril who said to him, Ikra, or read. Muhammad replied, but I can't read. Jibril hugged him very strongly. Then he let go of him and told him to read again, but Muhammad gave the same response. After the third time, Jibril told him, read in the name of Allah who has created all that exists. He has created man from cloth. Read, and your Lord is the most generous who has taught by the pen. He has taught man that which he knew not. Later, while the Prophet, peace be upon him, was outside of the cave, he heard a voice. It was Jibril, and he said, Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah, and I am Jibril. The Prophet was shocked, and he went running home, and Khadija was there. He asked her to cover him in a blanket and make him sit down. She did just as he said. When Muhammad, peace be upon him, had calmed down, Khadija asked him what the matter was. When he told Khadija what happened, she said, Fear not, for you are a man of truth and kindness. I certainly feel that you will be the prophet to our people. Allah will never forsake you. You are good to your relatives, truthful in speech, a help to the weak, and a support to the needy. These comforting words gave him a sense of assurance. Khadija took Muhammad to her cousin, Warqa ibn Nafil. He was a man of deep knowledge about the scriptures of Jews and Christians. When he heard the story about Jibril and Muhammad, peace be upon him, he assured Muhammad and Khatija that he was a prophet and it was Jibril who talked to him. Later, when Muhammad saw Warqa, Warqa told him that he was a prophet and that the people who had so much faith in him will cause Muhammad, peace be upon him, trouble, fight him, and they will make him leave his hometown. Of course, Muhammad was shocked. He asked Warqa if that would really happen to him. Unfortunately, that would happen to him. Khadija had faith in Muhammad and his honest nature made her his first follower. 
From that day on, Khadija became the first follower of Islam as well as the first lady to follow Islam. When the disbelievers of Islam saw more and more people were accepting Islam as their new religion, they declared that they were declaring a political and economic boycott of the tribe of Banu Hashim. This act took place in the seventh year after the Prophet, peace be upon him, declared himself as Prophet, and this act was known as Shi'ab Abi Talib. This act was so severe because innocent children starved and adults survived eating leaves. Yet, the true followers of Islam did not turn away from Islam, and in the end, they came out stronger than before. Khatija always supported the Prophet during this time. She was so important that one day, Jibril came to the Prophet and told him to pass on a message to Khatija. When he left, Khatija asked Muhammad who was it. The Prophet replied, That was Jibril, and he said to give salam to you. He brings glad tidings of a resting place in paradise for you, a place where there shall be neither fatigue, nor racket, nor clamor. That shows how important Khatija was. Khatija died just three years before the Hijra. She died at the age of 65 and in the year 620. The Prophet was heartbroken. Her grave was placed in a place called Hajun near Mecca. Muhammad, peace be upon him, looked in the grave to see if everything was placed in the right way. When it was, he carefully lay Khadija down. On that day, we lost the mother of all Muslims. She sacrificed everything for Islam. The Prophet was in deep depression when she passed away. The year Khadija died was known as the Year of Sorrow. In this year, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had to suffer through heartbreaking moments. The first one was the death of his uncle, Abu Talib. Even though his uncle did not convert into a Muslim, he cared for Muhammad his whole life. But the biggest loss was the death of his beloved wife, Khatija bint Khuwalid. She was so supportive of him, she believed every word that Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. Because of the death of Khatija and Abu Talib, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in deep depression. That is why the year Khatija and Abu Talib died is called the Year of Sorrow. After Khatija's death, one of the ladies of Quraysh, Khawala bint Hakim, came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, to help him, and she saw that he was in great depression. She tried to cheer him up, but it wouldn't work. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told her that it was okay because it was natural that he was being touched by Khatija's absence. He told her that she was a loyal and sympathetic wife. Later, when Muhammad had Aisha as a wife, he was talking about Khadija and Aisha got jealous. She told him that how could he miss his old wife when he had a better and younger wife than Khadija. Muhammad was furious, but he replied calmly, I have not yet found a better wife than her. She had faith in me when everyone... Even members of my own tribe and family did not believe me and accept that I was truly a prophet and a messenger of Allah. She converted to Islam, spent all her wealth and worldly goods to help me spread this faith, and this too at a time when the entire world seemed to have turned against me and persecuted me. The prophet thought that none of his wives matched up to the way Khatija had helped him and supported him. In conclusion, Khatija bin Khuwalid was a great person. She helped Islam in its earliest days. She helped the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his toughest time in life, and she was a great wife. She was the first woman and person to accept Islam. She spent so much of her wealth and gave it all to the poor. Khatija was a devoted wife to the Prophet, and she had a big heart. So without her, it would have been near impossible to spread Islam. Did you know that coffee was first discovered by a Muslim sheep herder? More than 1,200 years ago, a herd of curious goats discovered the simple yet life-changing substance. While the sheep herder's goats were grazing on the Ethiopian slopes, the herder noticed that his goats became lively and excited after eating a particular berry. Instead of simply eating the berries alone, however, these days those berries are boiled down to create what we now know as al-qahwa, coffee. Sword of Allah He was one of the most successful general of all time, fighting for the cause of Islam. 
he conquered Persia, Africa, Syria, Iraq, and all of Arabia. His enemies used to call him the person who conquers. His opponents shook with fear at his coming. He ripped the ranks of enemy and fought with courage and with determination. He won over a hundred battles and never lost a single one of them. He had great leadership and foresight and planning skills and always had faith in Allah that they would win. This is none other than Khalid bin Walid. Khalid was born into the Banu Makhzum clan of the Quraysh tribe who were known for warfare. From the young age, Khalid was drawn towards weaponry. At the age of five or six, Khalid was taught how to use any weapon, such as the spear, the bow, and the sword. He also learned how to wrestle professionally. Wrestling was a common sport among the boys of Arabia. When Khalid was about 11 or 12, the mighty Umar bin Khattab, the future second Khalifa, asked Khalid, Come on, will you fight me? Khalid agreed and they started the match. With ease, Khalid picked up Umar and threw him on the ground. There was a distinct cracking sound and Umar fell down and broke his leg. Such was the strength Khalid possessed from his childhood. About the age of 24, Khalid heard about the new religion, Islam. He always heard his father, Walid, and his cousin, Abu Jahl, the biggest enemies of Islam, saying, Muhammad should be stopped. He is teaching something different. He is against our gods. Khalid was influenced by his father and developed bad feelings towards Islam. He then tortured Muslims and caused bloodshed. After the migration of the Muslims to Medina, the Kuffar took all of their belongings. This was the cause of the Battle of Badr. Khalid did not attend this battle because of his absence from the Hijaz. His cousin, Abu Jahl, was killed, while his brother was taken as prisoner. Since the Muslims won, the Quraysh wanted revenge. This was the beginning of the Battle of Uhud. Khalid participated in the Battle of Uhud. Abu Sufyan was their leader. He told his men, Keep your eyes open for Muhammad. I will not rest until Muhammad is dead. The battle had started. Khalid fought vigorously and kept his eyes open for Muhammad for he wanted to be the person to kill him. Khalid, who was a master at war strategies, noticed that the Muslims were leaving their place from a key position. He prepared his army and caused confusion and panic among the Muslims. Khalid's army inflicted heavy damages to the Muslim army, and that was the cause of their retreat. On this, Abu Sufyan said, our gods have won today. Khalid started pondering on the new religion, Islam, during the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah, which took place in March of year 628. This peace treaty was between the Muslims of Medina and the Kuffar of Mecca. The reason for this peace treaty was to allow Muslims to perform pilgrimage in return for no conflict between them and the Kuffars. Khalid was so impressed with the Muslims as he saw that they attempted to perform their pilgrimage without any arms. He realized that the Muslims came for peace and not for war. This event started drawing Khalid's heart towards Islam and shortly after that, he made up his mind to become Muslim. He then set off for Medina. When he came there to see Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Medina for his conversion, he said, I have come to you with many sins. I have been horrible to the Muslims by beating everyone and causing everyone to suffer. I was the cause of your defeat in the Battle of Uhud. Please forgive me. The Prophet then said, 
A man who enters Islam, all of his past sins are forgiven. But Khalid insisted and Muhammad وسلم, made dua to forgive Khalid. Prophet Muhammad knew that having Khalid on their side, Islam would travel far and wide. After Khalid's conversion to Islam, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sent a messenger to call the people of Basra in Roman Empire towards Islam. While on his way, the Prophet's messenger was killed unjustly. This was the beginning of the Battle of Mutah. Prophet وسلم, dispatched Muslim army to take retribution for the killing of the Muslim messenger. The Holy Prophet gave Zayd bin Haritha the command of the army, saying, If Zayd is killed, then Jafar ibn Abi Talib will be the commander. And if he, too, is killed, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha will command the army. And if he is killed, then the Muslims should select someone as their commander. After Zayd was martyred, then Jafar bin Abi Talib held the flag. The enemy chopped off his right hand. He then held the flag with his left. The enemy then chopped off his left hand. After another injury, he too was martyred. Then Abdullah bin Rawaha was the commander. He was martyred as well. After the passing of all these leaders, the Muslims picked Khalid to lead the Muslim army. Khalid stood up with determination and picked up the flag. He became the commander. He fought courageously and under his leadership, the Muslims retreated successfully without any additional losses. After that battle, he said, I broke nine swords in my hand. The only sword I had left was a sword made in Yemen. From that day on, he was called Saifullah, the Sword of Allah. Few years later, at the Battle of Yarmouk, a Roman ruler asked for Khalid bin Walid. So Khalid sent his messenger, and the ruler said to him, We found out you came in search for equipment. You are people who need clothes and food. I will give each of your soldiers ten dinars, a set of clothes, and food. We will give the same to you next year. This enraged Khalid bin Walid. Khalid sent a messenger to say, Yes, we are hungry, and we are people who love to drink blood of our opponents. We heard that the Romans' blood is the most delicious. This was the beginning of the battle against the Romans. When the battle started, a commander from the Roman side came to Khalid. His name was Jarja. Jarja said, I want to know the truth, so do not lie to me. Yes, I will tell you the truth. Is it true that your prophet got a sword from God and then he gave it to you? No, that is not true. I am called the Sword of Allah because I am the one who fights harshly and courageously against the disbelievers for the cause of Islam. What does one have to do if he wants to become Muslim? Say the Shahada. He said the Shahada and became Muslim. He fought on the Muslim side and became a Shaheed. The Battle of Yarmouk was a comprehensive victory for Muslims against the large Roman army. It is seen by both Muslim and non-Muslims historian as a battle in which an inferior force managed to overcome a superior force by superior generalship. Muslims were outnumbered by at least thrice as many Roman soldiers. It was Khalid's military genius that rendered heavy losses to such large Roman army. Khalid utilized his reserve mobile guard forces to 
to assist left and right wings of Muslim army to cause retreat in enemy ranks, and then surrounded the enemy into a circle. This caused panic and uncertainty in enemy ranks, and the Romans started retreating. Khalid kept pursuing them and comprehensively defeated them. This defeat was the start of Rashidun Caliphate, capturing of entire Syria region. Khalid was a very humble man. Even though he won so many wars, he did not boast about it. He always attributed his victories due to Allah's help. He was a strong believer in Muslims' unity. When Muslims started attributing the war victories to Khalid, Caliph Umar removed Khalid from the leadership of Muslim army, saying that the victories were due to Allah and not Khalid. Upon receiving the orders from Caliph Umar, Khalid obliged and relinquished his post. He said, I hear and obey the command of the leader of the believers. When a soldier expressed his concern that this change will cause unrest and internal disagreements among Muslims, Khalid said, There can be no internal disagreements among Muslims as long as Caliph Omar is among us. Subhanallah! What an amazing and selfless leader Khalid was! He fought many wars after that under different people's leadership and fought every war with the same zeal and vigor as he would when he led the army. He was an ultimate team player. He never held a grudge or questioned Caliph Omar's decision. In fact, when he died, he left all of his belongings in the care of Caliph Omar for distribution showing his love and respect for Omar. When Khalid bin Walid was lying at his deathbed, he told his companions, I am dying on my mattress the same way a camel dies. There is not a place in my body where there is a scar from the battlefield. I would have wanted to die as a martyr at the battlefield. Upon this, the companion said, You are the sword of Allah, and the sword of Allah does not break in the battlefield. Since the passing of Khalid bin Walid, there has been many generals who have come and gone, but none with the courage and military skills as Khalid bin Walid, the greatest general of all time. If you have ever wondered how the sensor-based water faucet works, listen to this brilliant innovation. Back in the 13th century, an outstanding mechanical engineer named Ismail al jazari invented a wudu machine. This elaborate and artistic machine was made up of a tap and sink. It was also both mobile and created in the shape of a peacock. When brought in front of guests, a guest would tap the head and water would flow out in eight short spurts. This provided just enough water for ablution. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. This narrative is about his caliphate and some of his characteristics like generosity and mercy. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was a respected man throughout his life, before and after accepting Islam. He was born 44 years before Hijrah in Al Ta'if into the Banu Umayyah clan among the Quraysh. Uthman radiallahu anhu was the son of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's cousin. He was known as Dun Nurain, which means the man with two lights. He was called this because he was the only man in history to marry two of the Prophet's daughters, Ruqayya radiallahu anhu and Umm Kulthum radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once said to Uthman, If I had forty daughters, I would marry them to you, one after the other until there was none left. With regards to his character, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu once said, I had no interest in songs, I never committed any immoral deed, and I did not drink alcohol during the Jahiliyyah or in Islam. 
He continued his father's business and expanded it as a cloth merchant and became rich and earned a high status among the Quraysh. Uthman was loved dearly by all so much that Arab mothers would even sing to their children, By the most merciful, I love you as much as Quraysh love Uthman. Uthman radiallahu anhu's caliphate Uthman radiallahu anhu was the third caliph and his caliphate lasted about 12 years, expanding the Muslim state to Morocco, Afghanistan, and Azerbaijan. He was not appointed as a caliph in the traditional way where the previous caliph would choose his successor on his deathbed. Instead, the caliph before him, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, gave the rules to appoint a new caliph, based on the six members of the Shura Council during the last days of his caliphate. The Shura Council unanimously appointed Uthman radiallahu anhu as the next caliph. After taking his oath as a caliph, he declared that the highest authority in the state was the Book of Allah, the Messenger, and the example of the two previous caliphs, Umar and Abu Bakr. He said, I am a follower, not an innovator. After the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Prophet, I promise you three things. I will follow those who came before me in matters on which you were unanimously agreed, and what is decided by good people openly, and not interfering with you except when a HUD punishment is required. As the rightly guided caliph, Uthman radiallahu anhu made a request to his governors and commanders to Continue as you were when you were working for Umar, and do not change. Whatever decision you want to take, refer it to us, and we will gather the Ummah for consultation, then we will give you an answer. As a caliph, Uthman radiallahu anhu denounced playing with dice and use of alcohol. He said, Avoid alcohol, for it is the mother of all evils. He also enforced justice and equality using HUD punishment even on his own relatives. It is reported that Al-Walid ibn Uqba was the half-brother of Uthman through his mother and was appointed for various important roles during Abu Bakr and Umar's caliphate. During Uthman's caliphate, he was the governor of Kufa. One time, Al-Walid and two other men were brought to Uthman, one of whom was Hamran, and he testified that Al-Walid had drunk wine, and the other one testified that he had seen him vomiting. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, he would not have vomited unless he drank it. Uthman radiallahu anhu then said to Ali radiallahu anhu, get up and flog him. Ali said, get up, O Hassan, and flog him. Hassan hesitated, so Abdullah ibn Jafar got up and flogged him while Ali counted until he reached 40, then said to stop. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, The Prophet gave 40 lashes, Abu Bakr gave 40, and Umar gave 80. Both are sunnah, but this is dearer to me. Uthman radiallahu anhu dismissed Al-Walid ibn Uqba from his position as governor. This shows that Uthman carried out justice as per Sharia law. The Prophet Sallallahu influence on Uthman radiallahu anhu's personality. Uthman radiallahu anhu's personality was mainly influenced by keeping company with the Messenger of Allah and studying at his hands. That is why he was able to show his people the right way and lead them properly by giving them advice during khutbahs. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, This world is very deceiving, so let not this present life deceive you, and let no Satan deceive you about Allah. Learn from those who have passed away, then strive hard and do not be heedless. He narrated 146 traditions from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and was among very few people who were able to write down Quran. Uthman radiallahu anhu narrated a hadith on the importance of wudu. I heard the Prophet say, Whoever does wudu and does it well, then goes in and prays. He will be forgiven his sins between one prayer and the next until he prays it. The Prophet and Uthman were very close. 
the prophet said, Every prophet has a friend in paradise. My friend in it is Uthman. Uthman radiallahu anhu compiles the Quran. After Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's death and during Uthman radiallahu anhu's reign, hundreds of non-Arabs converted to Islam. Consequently, Quran was recited and written in different dialects and scripts. Uthman ordered to compile the Quran written in the style of Medina to create an official copy. He took original copies of Quran gathered by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and requested trusted companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make careful copies. He then ordered to destroy all unofficial copies and sent the five original copies to the greatest cities of his caliphate. Some of those original copies are still available in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and Turkey. Uthman radiallahu anhu's mercy. Uthman radiallahu anhu was eager to follow the example of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was narrated from Imran ibn Abdullah that Uthman ibn Affan went out to pray Fajr and he entered through the door and another man pushed and shoved at the door. Uthman radiallahu anhu ordered the people around to see who it is. They looked and found that it was a man who had a sword with him. Uthman radiallahu anhu asked, What is this? The man answered, I wanted to kill you. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Subhanallah, woe to you. Why do you want to kill me? He replied, Your governor wronged me in Yemen. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Why didn't you complain to me about your mistreatment? Then if I did not help you or settle the score for you, you could decide to kill me. The man said to those around him, What do you think? The people around said, O Amir al mumineen he is an enemy over whom Allah has given you power. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, He is a person who thought of sin, but Allah protected me from him. Bring me someone who will guarantee that you will not enter Medina again so long as I am ruler of the Muslims. So he brought a man of his own people who gave that guarantee, and he let him go. This is a good example of Uthman's forgiving personality because he forgave a man who had the intentions of murdering him. Another example is that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu used to get wudu water for himself when he got up to pray at night. People used to ask him why he didn't just tell his servant to get the water. Uthman said, the night is the time for my servant to rest. He could have easily told his servant to get him the water, but he would help himself instead of waking his servant whom Allah gave to serve their masters. Uthman radiallahu anhu's generosity Uthman radiallahu anhu was also one of the most generous of this ummah. From the time he became Muslim, he would free one slave every week just for the sake of Allah. In his lifetime, he had freed approximately 2,400 slaves. In year 9 of Hijra, Prophet Muhammad wasallam decided to launch an attack against the Roman Empire. He urged the wealthy Sahaba to spend on equipping the army to fight against the Byzantines. Abdul Rahman ibn Habab narrated about the generosity of Uthman radiallahu anhu when he said, I was present with the Prophet when he was urging the people to spend on the army of Tabuk. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Who will equip them and Allah will forgive him? Uthman radiallahu anhu stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, I pledge to give 200 camels with their saddles and equipment for the sake of Allah. Then, the Prophet further urges the people to spend on the army, and Uthman stood up again and said, O Messenger of Allah, I pledge to give 300 camels with their saddles and equipment for the sake of Allah. The Prophet said, Nothing could harm Uthman no matter what he does after this. And he repeated it several times. Abdurrahman bin Auf gave 200 ounces of silver, Abu Bakr paid all his wealth and left nothing for himself, and Umar ibn al-Khattab paid half of his wealth. Later, Uthman ibn Affan came again to the Prophet with 10,000 dinars. That's $1,828,000 in current value to donate for the Muslim army. It seemed that Uthman radiallahu anhu was the only sponsor for this new community. The Prophet then prayed, 
O oh Allah, be pleased with us men, for I am pleased with him. Once in Medina, Muslims were suffering from water shortage and there was no source of fresh water except for the well of Virruma. This well belonged to a Jew who was selling water to Muslims at a very high price. Prophet Muhammad said, Who will buy Virruma and share it with the Muslims in return for the reward in paradise? He asked the well owner, but he responded that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, my family and I do not have anything else. When Uthman radiallahu anhu heard this, he rushed and bought the Jews' well for a high price, 35,000 dirhams, which is 70,000 US dollars, for the ease of the Muslims. 35,000 dirhams was a large amount of money at that time. Then he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Will you promise me in return for it the same as you promised him? The Prophet ﷺ said yes. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, then I give it to the Muslims. In conclusion, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was a very generous, merciful, and a rightly guided caliph. He was held in high esteem by Prophet Muhammad wasallam as well as the other caliphs. He was second in closeness to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, known for his kindness and deliberation, keeper of his secrets, and being his senior scribe. During Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu's caliphate, Uthman was known as al-Radif because people used to approach the caliph through him. And what else could be better than the Prophet giving him the glad tidings of paradise during his lifetime and once said, Uthman is the most shy of my nation and the most honorable. You have likely heard of Vasco da Gama, the first known European to discover the Indian subcontinent, and Christopher Columbus, the first known European to discover America. But not many people have heard of Ibn Battuta, a Muslim explorer and scholar from Morocco. He left his family, friends, and hometown in order to travel 75,000 miles of the Muslim world. In modern terms, that equates to traveling through 40 countries. Many know him as the Muslim Marco Polo. It is reported that Ibn Battuta's travel influence came from the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, who had encouraged Muslims to seek knowledge even as far as China. Ibn Battuta took this message quite literally, and his journey became a kind of grand tour, mixing prayer, business, and adventure. Furthermore, as a Muslim, he had a full understanding of the codes of conduct through the 14th century Eurasia. Some of these codes of conduct included equality, charity, trade, good citizenship, and the pursuit of knowledge and faith. When he returned back to his native city, many people didn't believe his accounts. It was then, however, that the Sultan of Fez asked him to write down his experiences in a travel book. This travel book is now known as one of the greatest travel and historical books ever. The Slave Commander Do you know who was one of the best commanders of the Muslim army, the most honorable and loyal person? the most beloved to the Prophet? His name was Zayd bin Harith, and he was one of the most beloved companions of the Prophet. He was sold as a slave when his mother, Sa'da bin Thuraba, traveled to meet her family with her son, Zayd bin Harith. She had reached the house she came to visit when bandits of Banu Qais raided the place, stole everything they had, and kidnapped the children. At this time, Zayd was just eight years old, he was taken to the marketplace along with all the other kidnapped children, where they were sold as well. Zaid was sold to a wealthy chieftain for 400 dirhams, Hakim bin Hazim Khawalid. When Khadija heard of his arrival, she went to visit Hakim as he happened to be her nephew. Hakim bin Hazim Khawalid had said that he had bought a large number of slaves and he would be happy to sell her any slave she had wanted but something about the intelligence and noble look of Zayd bin Harith caught her attention. 
Upon the time of her marriage to Rasulullah, she thought Zayd bin Haris would be the perfect gift. As soon as Khadija had gifted him Zayd, Rasulullah had granted him his freedom. Zayd bin Harith was very fortunate to be raised by the Prophet. However, without their child, Zayd's parents were suffering a huge loss. They searched everywhere for him, and his father could not stay put at home. He would recite poems that are said to bring tears to every listener's eyes. He would travel from region to region, and there was no ground where he hadn't set foot. On the occasion of Hajj, some of Zayd's relatives came to Mecca. They were going around the Kaaba when one of them saw Zayd bin Hadith and recognized him immediately. When the news came to his parents that their son was in Mecca, his uncle and his father rushed to Mecca. They begged Rasulullah to have their son back, and they would pay any price he wanted. Can I show you a method better than paying a price for him? What is this method? I will call him here in front of you. If he wishes to go with you, he is free to do so. I will not take any compensation for him. But on the other hand, if he wishes to stay with me, then I will not force him to go with you. You can only imagine how excited the whole family must have been finally getting their lost son back. They were sure that they would get to take Zayd bin Hadith with them home. However, the Prophet ﷺ followed on his deal and asked Zayd bin Harith if he wanted to go with his uncle and father. But Zayd, with moments hesitation, said, I will stay with you. When Zayd's father heard him say this, he was very heartbroken. He said, This is very sad. Would you rather be a slave than stay with your own parents? Zayd bin Harith answered, Father, I am deeply moved by the praiseworthy qualities of the Prophet, the way he treats me with love and affection. I just cannot leave him and live somewhere else. When the Prophet ﷺ heard how deeply Zayd bin Harith loved him enough to leave his parents, he quickly rose up and took Zayd's hand and went to the Kaaba. He declared loud and clear in front of the chieftains of Quraysh, O family of the Quraysh, witness that this is my son and heir, and I am his heir. The father and uncle of Zayd were surprised to hear this, and also pleased. They went home, happy with Zayd's answer, because the Prophet was so caring and affectionate towards him. From that day on, Zayd was called Zayd bin Muhammad, until the verse in Surah Al-Ahzab was revealed, in which it said, Call them after their fathers, that is more just in the sight of Allah. One of the honorable things about Zayd bin Hadith is that he had no idea that the Prophet Wasallam's position would be elevated or that he would guide the whole world. He just had the trust in the Prophet because of his kindness and compassion towards him. This is one of the examples of how the way you act towards people makes a big difference in people's lives. Just a few years after Zayd chose to stay with the Prophet, he had received revelation. He was the third person who had accepted Islam. He was also one of the first commanders-in-chief of the army of Islam. Just as Zayd had shown great love for the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ showed great love for Zayd and considered him a true member of the family. When Zayd would leave on a mission, the Prophet ﷺ would pray earnestly and be very happy to see him return. Aisha Razia Ta'ala Anhu said that when Zayd bin Harith returned to Medina after a journey and came to their door, the Prophet ﷺ got up quickly to answer it. When he saw that it was Zayd, he smiled widely and gave him a warm hug and kissed him on the forehead. Aisha Razia Ta'ala Anhu said that she had not seen him greet any other companion this way. This is why Zayd bin Harith was known as Beloved of the Prophet, and his son was known as Son of the Beloved of the Prophet. Soon, in the eighth year of Hijra, the commander-in-chief for the Muslim army was captured and killed. Muhammad Wasallam appointed Zayd bin Harith as the new commander-in-chief for the Battle of Mutar. For the battle, Muhammad Wasallam had said that if Zayd bin Harith was murdered, Jafar bin Abi Talib would take his place. If he was to be martyred, Abdullah bin Rawaha would take his place. A white banner was raised and given to Zayd bin Harith. Zayd bin Harith took leadership and fought with his full strength and bravery until he fell. The Muslims suffered a great tragedy in the battle against the hypocrites and Roman Empire as all three commanders were martyred. The day Muhammad ﷺ heard of the death of all three commanders was very sad. He went to the house of Zayd bin Harith. 
His youngest daughter hugged him and sobbed. The prophet also started to cry. Zayd's daughter asked, O oh, prophet of Allah, are you also weeping? He answered, These are tears of a beloved for a beloved. Nuseiba bint Ka'ab, the Iron Lady of Islam Nuseiba bint Ka'ab, also known as Umm Umara, was one of the first female converts from the Ansar of Medina and was an important supporter of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umm Umara is well known for her courageous and heroic advances in the battlefield. She was a great swordswoman and one of the most skilled archers of the Prophet's army. Some of her other notable traits included a remarkable patience and self-control. She was also very learned in the Qur'an and Hadith. Nuseiba and her husband Zayd ibn Asim anhu, were among those who accepted Islam in its early years. She was one of the only two Ansari women who attended the second pledge of Al-Aqaba, where she pledged her soul and all her abilities to support Prophet Muhammad wasallam and his movement of Islam. It was during this pledge of Al-Aqaba that the group of people from Medina invited the Prophet to Medina to become their leader. In 625 AD, during the Battle of Uhud, Muslims were fighting the Meccan army that outnumbered them in many ways. During the battle, not only was Nusayba watering the soldiers and healing their wounds, but she was also encouraging the spirit of fighting in the Muslim soldiers' hearts. She even participated in the fighting on this great day. At one point during the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet took a heavy blow to the face that was so hard he passed out for a few seconds. Immediately, a few men of Quraysh pounced towards him so they could kill him. Nuseiba was nearby. In a flash, she drew her sword and joined the two Muslim men trying to defend the Prophet. She stood tall and determined against the Qurayshi men who were far bigger than her in size and more experienced in fighting. She fought blow for blow, protecting the Prophet peace be upon him, forming a human shield around him until he recovered and gained consciousness. She continued fighting valiantly by sword in an incomparable and unbelievable way. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, praised her action, saying, Whenever I turned my face to the right and to the left, I saw Umm Umara fighting above me. By the end of the battle, there were about 13 gashes all over her body. It is reported that some of the wounds were so deep and gruesome that she spent a full year in healing one of these wounds. On the battlefield of Uhud, Nuseiba showed that in fighting for her beliefs and her religion, she was capable of showing more strength, determination, and fortitude as any accomplished and celebrated Arab warrior. In spite of being such a brave heroine, she was very humble. She knew the ultimate purpose of her abilities, and she knew for what cause she wanted to use them. So on that day of Uhud, Nuseiba requested the Prophet peace be upon him to ask Allah to grant her and her sons companionship of the Prophet in paradise. The Prophet invoked Allah, saying, O oh Allah, make them among my companions in paradise. She said, From now, I won't be grieved by any of the worldly calamities. Nuseiba continued to benefit the Muslims with her inspiring presence in battlefields. Five years after Uhud, the Battle of Hunayn was fought between Muhammad wasallam and his followers against the army of Ta'if and their allies, the Bedouin tribe of Hawazin. Nuseiba played an effective role in changing the course of the battle's events. She told about her role on that great day, saying, On the day of Hunayn, when Muslims were completely defeated, I unsheathed my sword, shouting, O oh, Al-Ansar, why did you flee? It wasn't your habit to flee, she added. I followed one of the polytheists who wanted to pursue the fugitives of Muslims. I blocked his way till he fell off his camel. Then I hit him and took his sword. When Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, was determined to fight the traitors during his time as Khalifa, Umm Amara requested his permission to join the army along with her two sons, Abdullah and Habib. Abu Bakr allowed them to join the army. In this war, Nusayba displayed unsurpassable bravery. Nusayba showed an amazing example of patience when the body of her own son, Habib ibn Zayd, was torn into pieces by Musaylima, as he refused to be one of their followers. When she knew about that, she said, I have prepared him for death for the sake of Allah, and I ask Allah to accept him as a martyr. In the Battle of al yamama in 632 AD, she joined the Muslim army in order to get revenge on Musaylima. 
She participated in fighting and she was shouting all the time, Show yourself, Musaylima! O oh, the enemy of Allah! Show yourself! In her attempts to kill Musaylima, she was wounded about eleven times and one of her hands was cut off. By the end of the battle, Musaylima was killed by her son Abdullah after he was thrown down by the bayonet of Wahshi ibn Harb. The Battle of Yamama was the last war that Umm Umara witnessed. Umm Umara spent the rest of her life in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and after a long journey in serving Islam by her money, soul, and children, the Iron Lady's tranquil soul ascended to her creator.